All right, round one done. I still have a little bit of voice left, so hopefully I can get through round two. Again, so wonderful to be here with you this morning. And I am so grateful. Actually, I'm so filled with joy this morning to be able to, to, to uh, go in, uh, move on to chapter 11 of Hebrews. Obviously, this has been an incredible study. The Lord is so faithful. He's so good. And I love his word. It's so filled with truth. And... Um, I know that we have been blessed. I just was curious yesterday, so uh, as I finish things up and as I, I put the, the, the final uh, uh, touches on the sermon this morning, I, I thought, you know what, how, how many sermons have we preached in the book of Hebrews so far, so far? And so I did a little preliminary count. This will be 41. So 41, we're gonna, we'll definitely have a year of Sundays into Hebrews by the time we're done, and it's really wonderful. We have so much wonderful stuff to get into as we really finish out, round out the chapter, I mean the book, so to speak. Remember, we spent about 10 chapters on doctrine, 10 chapters on doctrine. If you rem remember a few weeks ago, I shared that I was sharing the gospel with somebody a few weeks ago, and uh, they were really hung up on doctrine, saying, doctrine's not all that important. Why do you talk about doctrine so much? Why is, brothers and sisters, doctrine is everything. It's our faith. Without knowing the doctrine, without knowing what we believe, how in the world can we believe it? How in the world can we be equipped to defend it? How in the world can we be equipped to truly know God and who he is if we don't know the truth of his word? And so we're going to continue to take our time as we, as we finish up these last three chapters together. Um, we don't do anything quick in the word of God around here, and none of you probably expect that we're going to rush through it, but I want to, to just let you know we will be taking our time, especially as we get into this beautifully rich chapter on faith. And this is actually the greatest chapter of, on faith found anywhere in the scriptures. And if you've read ahead, I think you have an, already have an idea of what I'm talking about. Absolutely beautiful. We're going to kind of get into the hall of fame or the, the, uh, the heroes of the faith as we work through this book. And look at these incredible men that have come before us, before us that have been so deeply and profoundly established in the faith that the hope is it'll raise our faith as we go through it. And it's really interesting, as, and we're going to talk about it this morning, their faith in what they placed their faith in was just a shadow, a whisper of what we now have been able to, be, to see and has been revealed to us through the coming of Jesus Christ. You got to think about it this way. I just, I have this in my sermon later, but I want to just digress a little bit right now. Think about how God revealed his salvation plan through the Messiah. He did it over thousands of years with one piece here and one piece here through this one prophet here, over hundreds of prophets. Many of these prophets might have gotten one whisper about the coming of the Messiah, and yet they placed their entire life upon that one promise, that one whisper. Brothers and sisters, we have seen the fulfillment of all the promises. And yet our faith wavers sometimes, doesn't it? We have men that have come before us that have placed their everything in just a glimpse of the Messiah. And just to kind of put that out there, what is the condition of your faith this morning? When you don't, you haven't just been revealed a glimpse of the Messiah, but you've seen the full revelation. How much more should our faith be? How much stronger, how much more secure should our faith be? Well, that's the entire point of chapter 11. The entire point. These men had barely seen anything. Actually, they, didn't see, they hadn't seen anything. They'd only heard that God was going to send a Messiah. And many of these men gave up their very lives to torture and even death. And so, what is the condition of your faith this morning? I just want to talk about that this morning. Now, that word faith, pretty interesting word. It's actually a super simple word, and we're going to get to that this morning. Very simple word. But there's a problem. You see, that word faith might mean something different to you this morning than what the scriptures teach. And so, really what we're going to do as we, as we really start off, as we kick off this great chapter together, we're going to define and simplify this word as easy as possible. I am not going to exposit some deep theological understanding of faith this morning. We don't need that. What we need is the simplified version. And our text gives it to us right in verse 1. The simplest definition of faith that you can find anywhere in the scriptures, and yet the most deep and the most profound that you can find anywhere as well. I love it. So we're going to get to that in a moment. We're not going to rush through this. There's so much interesting stuff here. And so over the course of the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at all these examples in the faith. But, but how do you 
understand these examples if you don't understand the word. And so that's the foundation of where we're going this morning. You might think, well, Pastor John, that's, that's a little elementary, isn't it, to talk about faith? All of us probably are familiar with faith. You know, we've talked about faith our whole lives. If you're in Christ this morning, the only reason you're here is because you have placed your faith in Christ alone. If you're truly in Christ this morning, that's the reason. So why are we going to spend so much time talking about faith? Well, because what the, the faith that the scriptures teach is unfortunately radically different than the faith that I think some of us maybe even here this morning have grown up understanding. You see, in the evangelical church, the greater evangelical church, there are many different definitions and understandings of that word faith, unfortunately, but it's true. And actually, a faith that some of you may have grown up learning and applying to your life, my guess is probably the complete opposite of the faith that the scriptures teach. And so we're going to spend our time this morning as we look at faith in greater detail and in greater context. Like I said, faith is actually the most foundational aspect of the entire scriptures. When you talk about the human and God relationship, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. Without faith, brothers and sisters, we have no relationship with God. And not only is it paramount or foundational to an understanding of, 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 of God and who he is, but it is the central theme of the life of a Christian. It is central to our lives. I, I, and I'm not over-sensationalizing this, brothers and sisters. It is truly the most central thing to the life of a believer, faith faith. Now, there's no shortage of teaching about faith throughout the Bible. The Old Testament is full of stories of faith, which is why I'm not going to spend any time in the Old Testament right now. We're going to be spending a ton of time in the New Te Old Testament in the coming weeks. But I just want to give you a glimpse, an insight into a few things that the New Testament speaks about faith. What role does faith have in the life of a believer? Well, Ephesians 2.8 says this, for gr by grace you have been saved through faith. And, not, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, who can... Who can argue with the amount of faith that is presented to us in John 3, 16? Well, you know, the, a verse, probably the first verse we're all taught, right? But look at the faith that is involved here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever has faith, right, believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, brothers and sisters, faith is the difference from, from, from succumbing to the warning, the destruction, perishing in hell. It's the difference. Anyone that is on their way to hell this morning, the thing they lack is faith in Christ. It is paramount. And yet when we believe, we are granted eternal life instead. Faith is that powerful. It has the power to change our eternities. Let's continue. From the last chapter, and I just, I had to throw this in there because we're talking, this is, a, this is three verses ago. We just looked at this last week. Hebrews 10, 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. The connection to righteousness is literally faith. Your connection to righteousness in Christ is only through faith. That's how powerful faith is. Look at, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him, right? Shrinking back, falling away, apostasy, we've been talking about that. That is the opposite of faith. So if you possess the opposite of faith this morning, which leads to apostasy, the Lord has no pleasure in you. Faith is the key ingredient to a relationship in God through Christ. That's how important it is. So are we going to take our time talking about faith? You betcha. Absolutely, we have to. Because it's that important. And I just think this is interesting. This is, uh, by the way, this is the author's uh, paraphrase of Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, verses 3 through 4. I don't know if I pointed that out that, least, that, that, that last week. This isn't uh, word for word, but this is kind of like you do when you're, you, you say, you know, I think the Bible says somewhere something like this, and then you say it. That's what the author here is doing in Hebrews. This is really a paraphrase of Habakkuk chapter 2. So one thing we need to understand up front is that faith is not only central to our salvation, of course, and our, 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 the, the abundance of joy and peace that comes through salvation, 
But a lack of faith is also uh, removes that blessing from God. It, it, and not removes, but it doesn't allow us to access that blessing from God. But faith does more than just give us that access to God. What, is it, what it does is it strengthens us as we sojourn through this world, right? We're just passing through here. Without faith, it would be really, really difficult to deal with all the stuff we have to deal with to get to the end, amen, wouldn't it? I mean, if you had no hope, if you had no faith that God was actually going to give you a reward at the end of all this, how many of you would continue on in faith? Probably none of us. Probably none of us. And so I want us to really consider this. You see, faith doesn't only have an end goal in mind. Although a huge portion of our faith is based upon that end goal, amen? I mean, I can't wait to spend my eternity in heaven in the glories of my Savior forever and ever. I mean, that's a cool end goal. But that's not the only reason for our faith. Faith is also the very substance that encourages us, strengthens us even, so that we can make it to that end goal. It gives us the encouragement we need to literally, as Paul writes to the Corinthian church, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Do you know that faith is a verb? It's an action word. It means we're going somewhere. It means we're doing something. It means we're growing. It means we're obeying. It means we're not just sitting around waiting for Christ to return. We are actively moving forward, pressing upward, onward in the goal and the higher call to serve the Lord. That's what faith is. And that's what true faith produces, by the way. True faith is not stagnant. True faith as... God himself warns, does not cause us to shrink back. It actually compels us forward. It compels us forward. This just came to my mind back when we owned that back, uh, backpacking store, uh, outdoor store, you know, several years ago in Muskegon. There was a, a pair of backpacking boots that literally, as you stepped, it compelled you forward. You, you couldn't, you couldn't, it was hard to fight back. It was hard to go backwards. Every step, it just naturally pushed you forward. Well, brothers and sisters, that's what faith needs to be to us. It needs to be such a force in our life, and we have, need to have such a grounded and profound faith that it, profe that it propels us forward. That even if we want to shrink back in times of fear, we have have no other choice but to continue to go forward. That's the kind of faith we must all possess. We walk by faith. And of course, we don't walk by sight. We'll get to why in a moment. But it's our driving force. It's our fuel that strengthens and encourages that, listen, no matter what comes, no matter where God leads, we will not be shaken. That's the power of faith. That's the power of faith. Simply put, without faith, we neither have any hope of heaven, nor do we have any power to live for Christ while we're here on this earth. And that's why I say it's the central ingredient to both the end goal of salvation and, of course, the, the vitality of, of the daily walking and living and moving and the obedience is to Christ our Lord. Now, what I want to do to, to begin this section on faith is to, is to simplify it. I already said that, but I want to remind you again. We're going to simplify this. We're going to slow it down enough so that we can give a clear, concise definition of this very familiar word. Because unfortunately, this word faith has been misused, misapplied, and mistaught so egregiously that once I reveal it to you this morning, it's going to be a shock of what some Christians think faith is, is actually the exact opposite, the antithesis. It couldn't be further from what biblical faith is. Because Satan has twisted this doctrine much like he's twisted any doctrine. This one's not exempt. But the great travesty is that I would even venture to guess that many here today, at least in part, have been taught a false doctrine of faith. Something so important, so foundation, something so really simple, and yet something so distorted. And so we're going to simplify it because the reality of faith as biblically taught might, it's not going to shock you when I give you the definition, but it's going to challenge you to think about which definition of faith you've been living by in the first place. 
The word itself is easy to understand, and I understand that the implications of faith are profound, right? The incredible mercies that are ours through faith in Christ Jesus. That they're endlessly wonderful. They're beautiful. They're deep. But the definition and the application of faith in the life of a believer is so wonderfully simple. And we find it here in Hebrews 11, 1. And so I put um, not both the NASB, which is uh, the official version that we use here at LWBC, a great version of the Bible, but I also put in the King James here because I love the English translation in the King James here. Both of them are actually very accurate to the Greek. There's no problem with either one of them. But I want to read both definitions this morning. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for in the conviction of things not seen. Now the King James puts it this way. Now faith is the substance. I love that word. Of things hoped for. Substance. And listen, it's the evidence of things not seen. Now that is almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Having evidence of something you can't prove? <laughs> I mean... And yet, why does a Christian have no problem with these two phrases? They both are nonsensical to the fleshly man, to the worldly man. They're nonsensical. And yet to us, man, this makes so much sense. It makes a ton of sense. We get this. Why? Well, we're going to get to that in a moment too. But this is it. This is the simple definition. Only two components. Two. To a biblical faith. It's the substance or as we'll look in a moment, that word literally in the Greek is foundation. It's the substance or the foundation of what we place our hope in. That's the first part of faith. What do you place your hope in? That's the question we ought to be asking because that's the, that's the question this is compelling us to consider. What do you truly hope in? Your faith will expose what you truly hope in, what you're putting your faith in. Secondly, it's the conviction or the evidence of the reality of things that you can't see. The reality of unseen truth. But like I said, as always, the simple definitions in the scriptures, Satan likes to twist them. He likes to contort them into an ugly beast that is nothing like the original meaning. Now, this word has been twisted so much that multitudes of professing Christians don't actually believe this definition of faith from Hebrews 11.1. 1. They don't believe what the Bible teaches anywhere on faith, but this presents a very serious problem for them. They've adopted a faith that is different than this. They've adopted a faith. When I say they, I mean, we'll get to who I mean in, in, in a moment, but many Christians even have been tainted by this. They adopted a faith that is self-serving. A faith that is self-serving. So what's the problem? Well, what's happened in the lar within the larger framework of evangelical Christianity is that there's a deceiving doctrine on faith that has infiltrated the church. It's infiltrated so deeply that I guarantee that if you have grown up in the church and you're here this morning, your definition of faith has been tainted by it. And this false teaching on faith comes out of the various charismatic movements that have swept through the church in the past hundred years or so. You see, what I grew up being taught about faith in charismatic churches, which I grew up in charismatic churches, is a far cry from what the Bible teaches. Far cry. Actually, as you'll see in a moment, completely unrelated. The conclusions they come to are at literally opposite ends of the spectrum. Within this movement, these charismatic movements, you've probably heard the word faith attached to several movements. I'm going to give you a couple of these movements, right? How many of you have heard of the word of faith movement, right? Word of faith. How about this? The name it and claim it faith, which is closely related, or maybe even the health and wealth faith. Now, faith is attached to all of these movements within charismatic churches. Now listen, from experience, I know these people talk endlessly about that word faith. Actually, it's about the only word that comes out of their mouth. Every other word is faith. Faith, faith, faith. If you just have enough faith, if you just believe enough, if you just do this enough, they are obsessive about this word, faith. 
I remember growing up in, in, in uh, one of these churches and hearing that, that, that word faith probably more than any other thing talked about. If you just have more faith, God will have no choice but to bless you. He will have no choice but to bend to your will and heal you. How many of you have heard that kind of talk in churches before? I remember specifically going to healing services where the minister made sure that you knew if you had the right amount of faith, you literally could compel God to heal you. It was dependent upon who, though? You. But as I grew in my understanding of the truth, as I searched the scriptures for myself, as I uh, matured in my sanctification, I began to notice something was completely off in their teaching. You see, when many professing Christians talk about the power of faith, they are not talking about faith as biblically defined. They're talking about a faith that has been completely manufactured, invented by them out of thin air. Completely out of thin air. When these various faith movements talk about the power of faith, they're talking about faith as if you possess the personal power to literally create your own reality, create your own future. Literally speak something into existence. That's what they mean by faith. They believe that if your faith is strong enough, you can change varying aspects of your life, the physical world, even the spiritual. And listen, this may sound absolutely blasphemous, and it is, but they believe it, that you even have the power to compel God to change his will and bend to your own will for yourself. If you just have enough faith. And I'm, again, not making this stuff up. I grew up with this stuff. Some of you came from churches were saved out of those movements yourself. I have literally been with some of these people and heard them speak out loud and say things like this. In the name of Jesus, I command. And then fill in the blank with whatever magical wish they want after that. Turn on TBN, don't do it, but turn on TBN later today and you'll, you'll hear a lot of that. You see, brothers and sisters, to them, faith means to possess the power to forge their own reality, to forge their own perfect existence, to forge their own wealth, their own health, and much more. Really, to use God to receive their own will. I was fishing with a man one time who was part of this movement, still is, who cast his bobber, and I remember it vividly. And as the, bobbers, uh, as the line is flying through the air and we're fishing and he's got this bobber out there, he said this, I command you in the name of Jesus to catch a fish. I, silly. We laugh. He didn't catch a fish. I remember thinking, who, who does this man think God is? His personal butler? Right? His genie in a, in a bottle or a bobber? And the answer was yes. Yes, that, that is who he thinks God is. His personal servant to bow to his whims and his will. This false, false faith, faith says that we have the power to command a healing from God, to bring a salvation from God. We have the power to change our economic situation by just speaking it into existence. We can have enough faith, we'll become powerful and have clout to be healthy. All you have to do is speak it and claim it. And God will give it to you. Church, I just want to say this. This is foolishness. It's foolish. It, on its face, it's foolishness. But when we compare it to what true faith teaches in the scriptures, it is absolutely blasphemous, is what it is. Because true faith couldn't be further from this. Because that faith is a lie. 
That faith is a deception. That faith is a satanic counterfeit. And yes, I will use the word satanic because it is. Every lie comes from who? The father of lies, which is Satan. And this is important. Please listen. Faith is not a power that you possess in which you can forge and create your own reality based on the own, your own whims and wills of the moment. That is not faith. Never has been, nor will it ever be. I'm going to tell you what faith is right now. Faith is your God-given ability to trust the future that God has willed for you. To trust the future that God has promised and leads you through without faltering. Huge difference, isn't it? One faith says I have the power to change my own future to one that suits me. And biblical faith says that God gives me the power to trust God's future and will for me no matter where it leads me. Literally opposite ends of the spectrum. It's not faith to attempt to command God to give you your way. That's not faith. Now, I thought about this for a moment and many moments this week, but if that were the biblical definition of faith, that we could just change our fortunes to whatever good thing we wanted, whenever we wanted, if we believed it a certain way, well, then there is not one man or woman in the Bible who actually had faith. Because that is not the testimony anywhere in the scriptures. You don't find a story like that anywhere. Actually, the heroes of the faith, the, the, the hall of faith, uh, or the hall of fame of faith that we're going to be getting into in the next chapters, not one of them lived by that type of faith. Let's look at, uh, just briefly look at Abel, because Abel is mentioned here. Abel certainly didn't live by faith if the definition is we can just change our life to however we want it if we have enough faith, right? He was murdered. How many of you this morning would have a faith to make sure that you were murdered later on? Nobody. So faith, if it's defined in a kind of name it and claim it way, well, Abel certainly didn't have that faith. How about if you look at Abraham? Abraham, he had a very difficult life. Very difficult life. There's a whole lot that went wrong around him. A lot of things that he did were, that were very stupid, a lot of heartache, trouble. Well, Abraham certainly didn't have that type of name it and claim it faith because his life definitely wouldn't have turned out the way it did. Moses was the same way, right? His life was extremely difficult. I can't imagine being Moses. And actually, at the end of his life, he didn't even get to enter the promised land. He died in the desert. So if faith is just getting what we want when we want it, well then, Abraham, I mean, Moses certainly didn't have faith. If faith is believing your own wonderful, riches-filled, prosperous, healthy future into existence, then the Old Testament and the New Testament do not have one story of a man or woman of faith. Not a single one. And yet, we know that's not true. So we know that that can't be the definition of faith. It can't be. Because the Bible is filled with stories of men of faith. Of true faith. Of biblically defined faith. Because faith doesn't mean a future that suits your will. That's not what faith means. If you have enough faith, your future will be the way you want it. Faith means that God will sustain us and encourage us to be joyful, to believe, to accept, and to endure the things that God has already willed for us. That's the difference. Faith gives us strength to walk through even the darkest valleys of this life. That's what faith does. It galvanizes, it literally galvanizes us in the will of God so that no matter where God leads us, I will never be shaken. 
because my faith in where he's bringing me is greater than the temporary struggles and suffering that this life can give me. Now let's go back to verse one. Verse one, we don't have to go back anywhere. Let's just keep looking at it. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, or if you're reading out of the King James, it's the substance. <laughs> faith is the assurance or the substance of things that you hope for. Now, the Greek word here means, as I said before, it means foundation. Foundation. Faith is the foundation to everything that we as Christians hope for. That's literally what this is saying here. Faith is the foundation or the substance of everything that you as a Christian hope for. And we have to be very careful here. What do you as a Christian hope for? Do you get to decide what you hope for? Or does God tell us what our hope in Christ is? See, this is where people get in trouble. They read this and they say, oh, it's the, faith, the assurance of things that I hope for. Things that I hope for. No, that's not what it's saying. Faith is the assurance of the things that every Christian hopes for because God has already told us what those hopes are. And actually, in the context of Hebrews, the author spent 10 chapters telling us exactly what those hopes are. If you're in Christ this morning, you hope those 10 chapters of Hebrews. That's where your hope is. If you're not in Christ this morning, what are you going to hope for? Health, wealth, riches, peace, your way all the time. You're going to hope, hope for fleshly things, not for godly things. It's the foundation of things that we hope for. Now, this is where the person who lacks wisdom, or actually most assuredly, lacks actual Christian salvation. They don't have a foundation that's the same as you and I. Somebody who's not in Christ does not have the same foundation as us. We do not have the same hopes. We don't have the same dreams, the same goals, the same, desi same desires. Why? Because when we come to Christ through true repentance and true faith, God gives us a new heart, amen? A new mind. He renews us from the fleshly way of living. And so we don't hold on to those old fleshly hopes. We find our peace now in the hopes that God has conveyed to us. So someone who's not founded in Christ, who still has worldly passions and worldly lusts, lusts they, would, they would read this and they would think that, the, that faith is the assurance of things that they want. And of course, then they would apply all the things they want to faith. The worldly-minded man hopes for a lot of things, right? A lot of things. Millions of dollars. Material possessions, beautiful women, fornicating, alcohol. I don't know, you could go on and on, right? That's what the worldly man desires. And so is it no wonder that people from the, the name it and claim it movement, those are the things they name and claim? Because they're worldly. They're not in Christ. They're in the flesh. And so they're going to hope for things that the flesh hopes for. Hope you understand the absolute danger of thinking that way because it exposes a greater problem. It exposes a fleshly man or a fleshly woman. So faith isn't a free ticket to the life of your dreams. Faith isn't a free ticket to desires of the lusts of your heart. Remember, the author is writing to early Christian Jews. That's the whole point of this letter. These early Christian converts that have just been set free from the idea that they could earn favor from God in any other way. Now, primarily in the, in, in the, in the religious of Judaism, it was through sacrifice. Ten chapters to say, listen guys, God doesn't care about your sacrifices. The Old Testament is done, it's gone. You couldn't earn God's favor with sacrifices in the Old Covenant system anyways. It was always by faith in the coming Messiah, just like it, uh, access to God in the New Covenant is faith in the Messiah who has already come. So the author is reminding this early church who is caught in the struggle of the in-between. Judaism is all they've known. There's a draw to go back, to shrink back to that system that they're so familiar with. 
And he's saying, no. No, stand firm. Do not shrink back and do it through faith in the things you hope for as a Christian. Remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus is greater than what came before. He's greater than the Old Covenant. That's the point of this book. He's greater than Moses. The New Covenant is greater than the Old Covenant. The promises of the New Covenant are greater than the promises of the Old Covenant. The incredible rewards and richness of the hope that we have in Christ is far greater than the Old Covenant could ever provide. Why? Because in the Old Covenant law, there was only death. Why? Because you couldn't keep the law in perfection. So it could only lead you to death if you tried to earn favor with God through obeying that law. You couldn't do it. You still can't do it today. You can't find favor with God that way. Never be able to get there. Now, what are these things, these, 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 these foundations that Christians hope for? If you're truly in Christ this morning, what are these things? What, well, all you have to do is really page through the last 10 chapters and you're going to find them. You're going to find them. Forgiveness. See, a true Christian hopes for forgiveness, don't they? Mercy from God. Salvation of our souls. A hope for a future heaven. Of course, with Christ, who is our eternal, as the author says in chapter 6, anchor for the soul. You see, those are the things that the Christian hopes for, right? We hope to experience God's mercy, grace, forgiveness, favor, salvation, and to go home to heaven one day to be with him for eternity. Now, if that is the foundation, the hope of your faith, is there anything in this world that is going to get you to shrink back from that? No, why not? Because your faith is founded. It's grounded upon the correct things to hope for. Now, if your faith was in riches, in things going your way, in health, in getting all these things that you want, how many of you are, you are going to have a faith that's going to stay intact for very long in this life? Because that's not how life works, right? What does Jesus say? In this world, you will have trouble. So if you're thinking that in this world you won't have trouble because all I have to do is have enough faith to not have it, trouble comes. Well, your faith is going to disintegrate because it wasn't real to begin with. It wasn't real to begin with. You see, brothers and sisters, these things, mercy, forgiveness, love, salvation, peace with God, these are the things that the Christian hopes for. So now does verse 1 make a lot more sense when it says, now faith is the assurance of the foundation of the things that a Christian hopes for? It makes a lot more sense. Because a true Christian doesn't have a foundation that hopes for riches or power or cloud or health. And so this is key. It's so vital to the proper understanding of faith. You see, you and I do not produce nor determine the substance of true faith. God already has. He's told us what the substance of true faith is. He's the one who told us what true faith produces. He's the one who told us what the reward of true faith is. We don't get to change it. We don't get to make it up. As true believers, all we can do, and I, say, I don't say all we can do as it's like not a, not a big thing. I just mean all we can do is just trust to receive those things hoped for from God through faith. I can't change God's will about that. God's already told me what faith is going to give me. I just trust him to receive it. Amen? That's faith. That is faith. I'm so thankful that God promised something far greater than an easy life with money and whatever I want. He promised me a favored eternity. I want that. As a Christian, that's what I want. What does Paul say? Anything this world has to offer, I count as rubbish. Literally garbage upon a stinking heap compared to the richness of knowing Christ. Faith. True definition of faith. 
And so do you see the complete opposite nature of the teachings of a false faith that is taught, unfortunately, in so many false churches throughout this world? A false, false, it's hard to say false faith over and over again all morning, I apologize. A false faith <laughs> promises that we can shape our own reward, but a true faith receives the reward that God has already promised. And this is what makes a true faith so powerful. If we know that the reward that we hope for is not in this life, that the reward is actually coming in the life to come, no matter what God wills for us in this life, no matter how hard it is, no matter how deep the valley that we have to walk through is, I will never shrink back from my faith because I don't expect to receive the reward of my faith right now anyways. I'm waiting for a time when I will. I'm enduring. I'm suffering. But praise God, I am being strengthened every step of the way. Because that's what true faith does. That's what true faith accomplishes. A true hope is not for earthly gain. Heavenly gain. It's not for temporal pleasure. It's for eternal pleasure. And part of the reason so many professing Christians lose their joy when the trials of life bear down on them is because they've bought into, at least in part, to a false understanding of faith. They believe the lie that it's God's duty to make you happy in life and to give you what you want when you want it. Now, as we journey or sojourn through this life, we will have troubles. Jesus said that. We will. Try telling that to a word of faith man or woman. Listen, you're gonna, if you're truly in Christ, you will have troubles. You will suffer. Jesus promises it. But listen, the foundation of our hope is not this world and what it has to offer. So to the true believer, that doesn't have the effect on us that it would on an unbeliever. I am not here, brothers and sisters, and if you're truly in Christ this morning, you are not here either to just kind of whiz through life with ease and comfort and joy. Now listen, it's hard in this country because we are filthy, stinking rich. Even if you are not rich in the eyes of this country, you are rich compared to the rest of the world. Filthy rich. If you have a floor in your home that is not dirt, you are richer than 89% of the rest of the world. And so, in this country, we've equated riches with God's blessing. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. At the end of this chapter, you'll notice how the author equates God's blessing Actually, the, 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 the last paragraph tells us God's blessing. Many were put to death, wandering around in the desert with sheepskin for clothing, living in caves, being sawn in two. And the author makes the point, these are the men of faith. These are the people we want to be. Complete opposite of what in this country we believe the man of faith looks like. The Christian expects, yes, expects that the will of God will lead them through dark storms, through raging seas, and through deep valleys. And if that's not your expectation, you need to change your expectation this morning. You will have trouble. But the true Christian holds to a faith that no matter how high the waves get, no matter how treacherous the storm, that no matter how deep and dark and low the valley, that God is with them every step of the way and they shall fear no evil. Amen? Amen? That is faith, brothers and sisters. That is faith. Now this is the first difference between a false faith and a real one. We have an assurance or a foundation, a hope in the things that God has told us. 
he's going to give us, not what we decide we want. First thing. Second thing. It's the conviction, or I love the King James here, I love it, the evidence of things that you have no evidence of. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's saying. It's the evidence of things you have no evidence about. Now, I want to start with this word conviction because it is so important, conviction. Now, conviction is a deep belief. It is an unshakable, unbreakable belief in something. A belief that is so much at the core, at the heart of a man. A belief that has such a grasp upon a man's soul that he will literally alter the course of his life for it. That's what conviction means. I believe something so much so that it will alter the very course of my life to live for it. How many of you would describe your belief in Christ as that? Now I thought about this verse for a while and of course the first question I asked myself and that we ought to ask ourselves this morning is why is conviction of unseen things so paramount to a true faith? Now the question actually will answer itself. If we were to keep reading <laughs> this morning, which we're not going to, it's a long chapter, we're going to spend a lot of time here, but if we were to keep reading, that, that, that question would answer itself. Why is it so important that the Christian believes in things that we can't see? Why? Because much that happens in this life is not going to make sense to you and me. That's why. And if God is leading us somewhere that we can't quite wrap our head around, we have to be like this. Lord, I have no idea what you're doing, but I trust you. You just go right ahead. Do what you need to do to conform me to your will and to accomplish your will through me. You see, that's what faith does. And when you have a conviction that you believe that that will be, that, that God will always lead you to his will, Lord, take me where you want. Take me where you want. What do I have to fear in that moment? That's why Abel could follow God. That's why Moses could follow God, Abraham. That's why Joshua could, Joshua could march around a city for seven days and know that God was going to de demolish the walls. I mean, who would do that? Who in, the, in their right mind would believe God and do that? A Christian. Someone who passes their faith in the Lord, right? God can tell us to go anywhere and we say, oh, well, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I remember several years ago when I went to Iraq and Egypt and I spent those few weeks there ministering and preaching at the, the National Men's Pastor Conference and all that stuff. And we're talking, this is, ISIS is still in Iraq. And, and I said, I'm going. I just feel called. I, I know the Lord's calling me to go. And I remember, uh, especially a lot of the women in my family, I love you guys very much, but they were terrified for me. They didn't want me to go. but I knew that God called me. So whatever happened, if I didn't come home, sure, that would have been sad. But I knew I had a conviction that God was sending me. Nobody else would go. Now, I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. What I'm saying is, brothers and sisters, faith will lead us to do those things. I'm not talking about foolishness, right? I'm not saying faith, you can go stand on top of the building across the street and jump off and flap your arms and you're going to fly. It's not silly stuff. Now let's consider the lives of these Old Testament, Testament heroes of the faith and to understand why, that, that, that why faith is an evidence of things that we can't see. Remember, and I, and I alluded to this, but I want to get into this a little bit more. These men lived during a time when the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah was only a shadow of a promise. It wasn't even a full promise yet. God was still revealing his truth through the, through the generations. Jesus was only a whisper of a coming. So the only thing that these patriarchs of the faith had to place their entire faith upon was incomplete information concerning a Messiah that God said is going to come sometime. Evidence of things not seen right there. Think about what Jeremiah endured. I love Jeremiah. That poor guy. <laughs> Man, 
Why did he endure that? Because in his prophecies, God told him what he was going to do. Jeremiah, this is going to be hard. No one's going to like you. 40 years of ministry where everyone hates your guts and tries to kill you and shuns you. I think I'd, I'd, I'd have a tough time if I had one week where nobody liked me. He had 40 years. And yet, why did he endure? Because his faith was placed into something even though he couldn't see it. He knew he knew, he was convicted that he had to obey it. I don't care if it's Isaiah, any other prophet throughout the Old Testament. They endured shame and torture, scoffing, public mocking, imprisonment, some even death. Why? Because they had faith in something they couldn't see. But not just faith, they had evidence, literally evidence why can a Christian have evidence of things that we don't see? Well, I'll tell you right now, it's through the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a little bit. Why can you and I, or why can these patriarchs have so much faith in something, even though we can't see it, that it literally becomes to the point of evidence? Something that truly makes sense to us, that in the, our heart of hearts, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt is true. Because the Messiah was revealed by God over the course of thousands of years and through hundreds of prophets, each only getting a small piece of the pro promise, and yet these men held on to that veiled promise with their lives. Never let go. Through persecution, doubt, toil, suffering, even death, there was not one messianic prophecy that these men could touch and feel and see, and yet they gave their life for the sake of their Lord and anticipated and looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. They hung tightly to their conviction into the thing unseen. That's incredible faith. Incredible faith. These men did not seek personal wealth. They did not seek a life of ease. They did not seek clout. They did not seek all the things that the false word of faith movement will tell you we should seek as Christians. They understood that the promise of the Messiah was much greater than any earthly gain could ever grant them. Well, brothers and sisters, we're on the other side of the cross in world history, right? We're on the other side of it. They were, on, they, were, they, were, they were walking the earth before the cross. We're walking the earth after the cross. But I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you saw Jesus Christ breathe his final breath upon Golgotha? How many of you were there? How many of you physically saw the risen Christ and placed your hand in his wounds? How many of you have seen the second coming of Jesus Christ already and actually seen the glories of heaven? You see, brothers and sisters, we're in the same position as the men and women of faith that came before us. We're just on the other side of it. And yet, each one of you here, I pray, some of you I know, but I pray each one of you here have placed your deepest conviction, your deepest belief in the evidence of things unseen. So deep is your conviction, it's so real is the evidence to you, there is nothing I could do to shake you off upon that foundation. You're convinced because the Holy Spirit of God has convinced you. That's why. You didn't convince yourself. God has convinced you. And if your conviction is true and it is deep and it is founded in Christ, then what's the result of your faith? Well, it produces a substance or an evidence within us. Not a substance or an evidence that we decide ourselves, but one that God has revealed to you. The reason you believe that Jesus Christ, that God became a man, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, died upon a cross to pay, put the sins upon a, the, of the world upon himself, that three days later he rose again, that he ascended into heaven, and that one day he will come again to judge both the living and the dead. The reason you believe that is because God revealed it to you. And when God reveals something to you, all the evidence you would ever need is complete in a moment. In a moment. 
Now, what does it produce? Because there's always outward evidence of an inward change, and I say that often, but it's true. What does it produce? Well, the evidence that you believe in the things you can't see produces something very incredible. It produces obedience to the Lord. Right? We pray. We minister to one another. We love like Christ. We share the gospel. We worship. We study his word. We crucify the flesh. We reject the ways of this dark present age. We reject the things of the world in favor of the righteousness of Christ. There's the evidence, the outward evidence of the inward evidence right there. If you're in Christ this morning, those things I just said are the things that drive you. In short, when our faith is founded in Christ and based upon a deep conviction of spirit, we, we obey the Lord in everything he commands. So the inward evidence that convinces us and convicts us has an outward evidence as well. Faith is beautiful, church. That's why you can't fake it. You can't fake it. If it's fake, at some point you're going to shrink back when the world comes bearing down on you, when the, when, when the boat gets rough, rocks a little too much, and you're going to give yourself up because you'll have no evidence of an inward evidence. No outward evidence of an inward evidence. And so that is the substance or the product of the evidence of a true faith. It's always seen in our obedience, in our actions. You see, we are going in a direction that is radically different than the direction of the world. If you're truly in Christ this morning, you are going in a different direction, and it's radically different. Radically different. And that's the same for every believer through every generation. We look different than the world. We do. We're compelled to. We can't help it because we have a new heart and a new mind and we don't love the thing, things that the world loves anymore. And throughout the generations, because Christians go in a different direction, they've been misused and abused, trampled, mocked, scorned, falsely accused, murdered, you name it. But even in the midst of all these struggles, true Christians endure in the faith. Because God has given them the faith to endure. He's given them an inward evidence that could never, ever, ever be shaken. And this faith is so strong, it's such a force that it compels everyone who's in Christ to constantly stand against the tide of a culture that's walking in a different direction. I mean, we're paddling upstream when this culture is flying downstream. They're bumping into us and they're trampling us and they're, they're, they're mocking us along the way and at some point in this country they'll be doing a lot worse than that. And I thought about this one last thing to consider long and hard, this word unseen. To a lost and dying world, this word, word doesn't make any sense. As humans, we have five physical senses. Right? And we want, to we want to test everything to those senses. Everything is tested by those senses. We want to be able to touch it, hear it, smell it, taste it, see it. There's my evidence that something is true. Right? So science is supposed to be based on evidence, although there's very little actual science in the world anymore. But as a Christian, this conviction of faith that is produ produced in you and me through Christ in every other believer, we're given a sixth sense. And it's a sense that is more powerful than even our physical senses. It's more convicting than our physical senses. It makes more sense to us and is more believable than our physical sentences, our senses. There are a lot of things in this world that I can hear and see and I still don't believe them. Turn on the news later. I see them, I hear them, I don't believe them. And yet we have a faith that far surpasses the mere physical evidence that anyone can present to us. A Christian soul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, recognizes truth. We understand the scriptures. We understand the spiritual realities of the world and the struggle of darkness versus Christ. Every spiritual reality is a greater conviction to us than even our physical senses are a conviction to us. We find greater comfort, greater trust, greater hope in what is unseen than we do 
than what is seen. Do you understand that? Isn't it amazing how that happens? And it's, it's all God, brothers and sisters. If you, if, you, if you believe that way, if you are put more hope in the thing you can't see this morning, it's only a work of the Holy Spirit. You can't produce that on your own. That's why the Bible says that, that, that we are saved by faith and it is a gift from God. God gives it to you. Because the world doesn't operate that way. It's why Christians have the supernatural ability to stand firm in the unseen truths, even as their physical senses are being abused, tortured, misused, condemned, accused. We stand firm in the spiritual truth, even over the physical realities. Say what you will and do what you will to my body, but my conviction in the unseen... runs so much deeper and is so much greater than anything you could take away from me physically. That's faith. That's faith. That's the substance of faith and it is the result of faith. But a false faith seeks their own substance, their own reward, and their own desire based on their own convictions and their own understanding. But after today, I hope you can see why that so many profess to know Christ and yet live so, so detached from Christ. How can that be? Well, I, they don't have true faith. You should be able to recognize that this morning. They don't have true faith. A faith that they have used to create or shape their own future instead of surrendering to Christ and the future that God has already decreed for them. And so that's really the question for all of us this morning. Which faith do you rely upon? Simple question, but it's the most profound question we can ask ourselves. Has your faith been tainted in any way by a false understanding of faith? If it has, brothers and sisters, let's get back to true faith. Let's begin to understand and more than understand. Let's live and walk and breathe in faith together. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and, and Lord, we are just always so blown away by the incredible, profound, and yet often so simple truths of your word. Thank you so much, Lord, for revealing your truth to us, for rewarding us, Lord, with faith, a faith that allows us to stand firm in the truth regardless of the physical world around us. Lord, for those of us who are in Christ this morning, may you increase that faith. May you secure us even deeper. May you anchor us to that foundation of faith in Christ. And Lord, may the evidences of that faith continue to show more and more each day as we live and surrender our life anew and afresh with each and every waking moment. Father, if there are those here this morning who have in any way founded their faith upon a false faith, Lord, I pray that you would reveal your truth to them, that you would heal the brokenness of their mind and heart and replace their false faith with a true faith in Christ alone. As always, Lord, may you receive all honor and praise and glory forever and ever for the work that you do in all our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.